strength in Leos. What's up, everybody? It's Evan back with the Strength in Leos podcast. Hope everyone's having a great day today. We have an awesome banger of a guest lined up uh, today. It's a guy that you guys all know and love. Uh, Chris, welcome back to the podcast. How's it going, man? What's up, man? I'm good. How are you? Good to be back. Good, good. It's like your 80th appearance on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Regular guest. Uh, at this point, I always joke, Chris is taking over uh, very, very soon. <laughs> Yeah, right. How long has it been? Uh, it has to. Has it been a year? It has to have been more than a year that I've been on. Feels like yeah, long, about a year. Yeah, about a year. So we got a lot of a lot of catch up on, man. That's good. Uh, too much of too much of me is not a good thing. So it's <laughs> good. Just space it out. No, 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 no. People, people love that of you. Uh, so yeah, it's been a year since uh been on the podcast. You've come on. Um, yeah. How are things going? Uh, with the operation, uh, with the fam. How's all that going? Uh, still in leopard geckos. I'm guessing. <laughs> still holding it down. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um. You know, things are good. Um. You know, gec- my season anymore. It doesn't. It never really stops. So it, it's you know the the end of the 22 season just rolls right into things starting to hatch from 23. So there's, there's no break. It's been that way for the last couple of years, but it's, um, it's all good. I mean, things largely are, are, you know, good and keeping it interesting and a lot of cool things happening here. Um, family's good. Um, for those that have heard the previous podcast, you know, uh, the issues with my wife and, and health, like that's all good. Um, an update on I'm sure there's some people that are wondering about the the build uh you know and the facility and the debacle that happened with all that um i can't talk about it too much but we're actually uh in court as we speak uh you know with the contractors uh about what happened with the the build here so um there's a lot going on a lot a lot of things in flight but um yeah i think it's all all largely trending in a, in a positive direction. So, um, nice. you know, the intention is hopefully things work out uh, as we expect them to with the, the court case. And then it will be literally starting back over from ground zero of getting back to the build again. So, you know, we lost a year <laughs> or so of time in there somewhere, but, um, you know, all for the best ultimately with that. Um, because I, you know, when the build was done, I was, I was literally getting to a place where I was getting ready to leave my corporate job because it was kind of at that time, it was at the peak of the hobby, you know, kind of back end of the pandemic. And, you know, the, I think for a lot of people, you know, the money was flowing and, you know, supplemental kind of things coming from the government. And, you know, there was a lot of people spending a lot of money on leopard geckos. Um, and the economy wasn't a much better spot. Um, but then with the room, what happened with the build it just didn't make sense so opted to kind of take a step back on that and and ultimately that was a good decision because then the economy tanked and you know we know the hobby is not necessarily thriving right now so that could have been quite a bad decision for me if i would have left my job uh you know when i felt like everything was at its peak because it it kind of went over the peak and and kind of tanked shortly after that so Um, you know, I'm not a big, everything happens for a reason guy, but in this case, it, it kind of feels that way. So, um, good time to, to take a step back. Um, you know, when things are in a lull like this and, you know, I realized that 14 years into this, I had not really, um, I don't know, taking kind of an inventory of the operation and, you know, animals that are you know a bunch of animals that are still here do they still need to be here you know it's animals that haven't been geckos that haven't been bred in years um you know and you end up with racks full of this stuff over time when you know you're not being really intentional about you know what you're doing and like you know moving those animals off as pets and things like that so uh my wife is a really talented pm so i just asked her i'm like hey you know while things are kind of in this valley would you basically come down and just go through the entire collection? Like I'll give you as much data as you could ever need on, you know, every animal, every tub, 
and from a PM perspective, basically take that thousand foot view and look at it and find like where all my inefficiencies are and what I need to be doing better. And, you know, Chris, why do you have like 20 of, you know, this animal of this particular, you know, sex? And um, so, so we're in the middle of that right now, just literally doing a deep dive on everything here, um, you know, getting it out on, on paper, so to speak, and, and trying to kind of, I want to say like clean things up, but uh, you, you know, you just realize like with me you know, for the last 14 years, obviously my records and things like that are intact, but a lot of these things like the projects and, and, you know, what I'm doing, like, it's all kind of in the back of my head. Um, I wouldn't say off the side of the desk, but, um, I don't know. You look at it and go, it's probably long overdue, you know, for an operation this size and that I've been doing for this long, like, um, you know, there probably are missteps that, that I have in here, things that I could be, you know, doing better, you know, like I said, too heavy in, you know, one particular project because you get into this contingency planning mindset, like, oh, like if, if my cornerstone mail for this project, if anything were to happen to him, then I'm in big trouble. So I need a backup for him. And then you go, oh, but I need a backup for the backup. And, you know, before long, you've got like six or eight <laughs> backups. Right. So, um, so yeah, uh, it kind of her keeping me in check on not being like a, an unintentional hoarder, um, you know, <laughs> things either. So, uh, so yeah, y'all can all relate to that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've definitely had conversations with uh, with other breeders over the years that I think uh, you know a lot of people um, can kind of fall into that that habit. Um, so I don't know. Just trying to. Just trying to iterate on on whatever I'm doing here and and you know it's not just about the animals you know it's the operation too and you know trying to be smarter and more efficient and so um you know my wife is is really strong in those areas so um you know looking forward to see what the outcome of all that is uh, you know unfortunate for her she has to sit and listen to me talk for <laughs> hours about you know why this particular animal is important and where it came from and the you know so She's yeah. documenting all of that stuff. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of what's, nice. what's going on here. Yeah. Also doesn't help that you're always going a million miles an hour. So <laughs> doesn't yeah. ever seem to stop for you. Mm, yeah. It, it's definitely, um, sometimes it feels like you're just constantly chasing your tail. For sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, by I think the last same time token, we talked too, I think you, that's when you were first getting into Dawn's collection too. Um, getting that stuff oh. integrated into your stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, that's been that's been an interesting process. Um, and you know, as per usual, I'll just kind of you know pull back the veil on on most of this stuff. I think you know when I got Don's collection, you know the the fanboy, you know the leopard gecko fanboy in me, like the, you know this is going back, you know probably ten plus years, you know before Don and I were even friends, and like Don's animals at the time back when the hobby was what it was back then, you know, that was a huge reason that I was so excited about things. It was people like Don, it was people like John, like those are, those are the people that I had to kind of aspire to, you know, back in the day. And, you know, obviously over the years became really good friends with Don and, um, you know, had brought some of, you know, his lines in over the years, but like when he was getting out, um, you know, it's a big thing for me, you know, a lot of pressure that I put on myself to, keep his stuff well and and moving forward and not lose all the work that he had done and i think what i found was is that i became so focused if not obsessive about that part of it you know when i brought his collection in here that i let focus go away from my own collection um it really became uh you know, how am I going to keep, you know, this white and yellow bell stuff going in the atomic electrics and all the, you know, Don's white and yellow tremper line and all of the things, um, you know, that were really important to me of, of his stuff to keep going. Um, and I put so much focus there that I think subconsciously with, with my animals, it was kind of like, Oh, well, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is really nice. So, you know, if, if this goes with this and this goes with this, like, you know, it's 
we'll keep this going. It's going to create nice stuff, but you know, all my focus is, is going to be over here. And I think, you know, I produced, I certainly produced some, some really nice animals last year and the year before, but when I looked at the numbers that I had produced juxtaposed against how much nice stuff versus stuff that when I was going through the racks cleaning, I was just kind of like, mm, like, um, and the more that I stepped back and looked at it, I think, you know, the reason was, is that, you know, it does like, you do need to be focused on the pairings that, that you're making your decisions do need to largely be intentional about what you're doing and not just working this stuff side of the desk and, you know, putting, you know, whatever tremper with whatever tremper, you know, just because they're, you know, they're two nice animals doesn't necessarily mean that pairing is going to net out to nice offspring. And, you know, I think I had to come to the realization with myself that it was, it was my animals and my vision and my looks and all the things that were like me and suburban geckos, like that's what got me to, to wherever I am in the hobby or, you know, get you to where you are in the dance, right? Like it wasn't, it wasn't the work that I did for 12 years or whatever. It wasn't the work that I did with Don's animals to get me to this spot in the hobby. It was all the stuff that I did with my own. So, you know, it was kind of this very, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I just came to the realization that, you know, it, it has to flip the, the sustainability of Don's collection and all those lines has to be ancillary. Like it has to go more to the back burner and the focus needs to shift back to primarily my stuff. And, you know, even, even this year, um, you know, I probably in the last couple of months, I probably have a hundred on the ground so far from 23 and the results that I'm seeing post making that conscious shift are significantly better just from a, a, a holistic perspective than, um, than what a lot of the stuff was that I produced in the last couple of years. So, um, it's been a long journey with that stuff. Uh, you know, I, uh, I shared with you, Evan, and I will, I will share on here. Uh, it, you know, when I, when I asked you, you know, how many white and yellow bells do you think that I've held back from the high woods collection in the time that I've had them? Um, and the answer is zero. So, you know, you're talking about what I felt like was like the nicest white and yellow bell stuff, at least some of the top stuff in the hobby and the pairings that that I was doing. And these were even pairings that Don had done over the years. Like they just weren't they weren't netting out. Um, you know, I'm not going to say they weren't nice animals, but as far as like kind of, you know, cornerstone, top of the mark, you know, in the hobby things that you're going to take to, you know, to, to move this stuff forward it just wasn't there so that was creating an additional level level of of anxiety with me as i'm sitting there going like why why is this not working you know a lot of these animals are especially the cornerstone males five years six years seven years old um so in my head like the clock is ticking on this stuff so there that, that's another layer of of uh of anxiety but i for whatever reason uh this year, you know, a lot of the same exact pairings that I did for the last two years with Don stuff, and now, now the cool stuff is starting to pop out. So, nice. uh, yeah, it's it, I I don't I don't understand. You know, I don't even necessarily think there's a, a rhyme or reason. You know, or some kind of logic there. I mean, nothing changed in the environment here. Uh, you know, I. I get to this point where, you know, this far in, like I tend to kind of go down the well and I'm, I'm like grasping at straws, like, you know, does it have anything to do with like, you know, moving the group from, you know, like Don's area down in Texas, like, you know, up here and like the difference in, you know, climate and, you know, maybe my husbandry is a little bit different than what Don's was. Maybe, you know, my supplementation is different. All these little kind of micro adjustments. Um, or maybe it's just, it's just mother nature and you know bad luck you know for for a couple of years um it goes back to that whole thing of like just because you put two really nice geckos together doesn't mean that that's what's coming out um i think i experienced the really really challenging bad end of that because the like i said i you know um 
the holdbacks that I had from anything that I produced from that collection. I'll say the most the it, you know that first iteration, that first year or that first couple of years, um, the the as far as success wise, the most success that I had was with the funky jungle stuff, like that stuff, like F one generation of the crosses that I was doing here was you know produced things that you know I held back you know a good couple of handfuls of that stuff. Um, so, but long and short of it, I think things seem to be heading in a much better direction with the highwood stuff than than they were before um, but there was no shortage of frustration and challenge the last couple of years in in dealing with that but i definitely feel like looking at you know what's now my operation as a whole you know don stuff my stuff like all the stuff like i'm i'm feeling a lot a lot better uh now this year than i did the last couple of years i think the last couple of years there's a lot of you know we go through these struggles of you know is it time to is it time to get out you know is this a sign that you know i'm done like you know i've lost my creativity and you know my, my vision for this um and based on like i said the the output that i'm seeing so far this year i would say the answer to that stuff is is no um i, I just think it's probably unrealistic to think that every year is going to be a banger you know um and if you have you know if you're in it for 10 years and seven or eight of your years are bangers and you have two that are rough like that's probably expected um to some degree uh, i think it just really surprised me you know because you know you get into this mindset of subjectively like everything here at this point like there's really not a lot of like lower end or mid grade animals. And this goes back to like conversations that you and I've had before, right? Like everything's very intentional. Like if I only have this much space for all these tubs, like all of those have to be maximized. Like, you know, the vast majority of stuff here is subjectively really nice. So it just goes to show like, you know, take, you know, going with that mentality of, you know, I can kind of, you know, I don't have to be super intentional. I can just kind of throw, whatever together from these projects and you know we'll be good like i proved that theory at least in my operation that that's not the case like it does have to be like intentional and thought behind you know what you're doing and not just winging it because i have all this nice stuff and i've been doing it for so long that i can just not even really think about it like i i, I saw the results of that and i won't be doing that again anytime soon <laughs> Yeah, and I think now more than ever, it's like super important to just really be intentional about what you're doing, look at your operation. I think it's super smart what you're doing, um, looking at inventory and seeing what you have, what you don't have. And if you have tubs that aren't like going to use, A, that's like just more geckos you got to like feed and clean. And then B, if it's not putting on the output, uh, output, then it's just draining into the stuff that you have have going on in so many different ways. And I think that's really important now where it's not like – you're not a Pokemon collector. Like you're not just collecting things and having those in. There has to be some kind of reason why you have certain things. Um, and there are like some of those things that you have for sentimental value. And that could really tug at your heart a little bit. But I think the deeper you get into, like we've been talking about intentionality, the deeper you get into, okay, why is this animal actually here in my collection? And what is it doing for me in the long run? At 100%, you know, there, like over the last couple months, so many tubs that i was going through that i was like okay you know this this female uh has produced nothing since she's been here or two eggs over the last three years or like you know it just i think there is some of that you know kind of connective tissue with some of these animals that have you know been with you for a while or at one point they were part of like the start of like you know a, a, something like you know like the atomic g uh tremper stuff like you know i have people asking me about that and i'm like I, you know i'll just be transparent about it like it you know it was uh, probably two three ish years ago that i had popped out two of the best a male and a female the two best that i've ever produced and like i looked at them and i was like oh like that's the now it's going to take a big leap forward um and unexpectedly you know the man it's one of these geckos that you just go in there one day and the healthy gecko is just 
he's passed, right? Like I don't, yeah. there's no rhyme or reason like, uh, you know, so, but long and short of it is that that takes that project and just steps it back. You know, it, it's like one step forward, three steps back. And, and, um, so you start going through the process of, of rebuilding. Well, you know, two of those females weren't really producing that well, but it's that, it's that attachment and, you know, trying to rebuild this stuff and, and being probably, it's more than hopeful. It's really like idealistic that, you know, that they're going to produce and, uh, and they didn't. And, and I looked at them this year and I'm like, you know, it's time, it's time for them to go be a pet, you know, a, you know, they'll probably get to live, you know, the rest of their life in a, you know, in an aquarium and probably getting, you know, a bunch of attention from, you know, whoever takes them on as a pet, but, you know, not to be harsh, but like, they're just not, they're just not producing anything. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not at this stage of the game, like, I mean, I love the geckos, but I'm also not ha trying to have, you know, 12 or 1300 pets right here either. Um, and, and you just, I think, to varying degrees for people like you just get so busy and so into the routine that it's kind of like back of mind like you're like i'll get to that later and you don't and then it becomes two of those animals and then it's six of those animals and then you go oh god like i've got 20 things here or 60 things here that aren't really producing aren't doing anything like i just keep going in there and cleaning the tub and feeding um and it's like why you know why are you doing this and i think a lot of that came to light like you know, my general, general ish rule of thumb for holdbacks is holding back like 10%, you know, every year. And, you know, unless you have just a warehouse, you know, to, to work in, everybody has some limitation on what space they have, right? Yeah. Whether this is, whether their operations relegated to a spare bedroom, whether it's your entire basement, uh, whether it's the corner of the living room, like everybody's got X amount of racks and X amount of tubs. So, you know, I'm looking at these potentially game changer new young you know breeders that you know are holdbacks from last year and i'm going well like i have this many and i have this many open tubs and you start going through things and going oh well of course like you know i'm i'm keeping a ton of animals around here that aren't doing anything but, you know i basically they're more or less they're like 40 50 60 pets that i just keep taking care of you know every week so um so it's that kind of stuff that like right now, the work that I'm doing with my wife, I think is going to help really kind of bring things current as far as kind of cleaning through, you know, the collection um, and just being much more efficient. And then I think moving forward, part of that is being intentional, right? And that um, I, I don't, I would never advocate for anybody to, to be too knee jerk with these decisions, but if to, for me, like, I think the, the line I'll set for myself is if, is an example, like a female, you know, four years in isn't, isn't producing anything. Like I would never say like after a year, and I think two years is probably cutting it too close to like, Oh, if she hasn't produced anything in the first year or two, like, you know, move her off as a pet. Like, yeah, that's probably a little short sighted for some geckos, but like four years in, if, if you're not producing anything, you've tried different males, like you're either getting nothing or you're getting, you know, all the eggs or water balloons are bad. Like, it's probably a good sign that that's that situation isn't going to change. Mm -hmm. So it's it's trying to get more proactive about identifying that and doing something with that situation in the moment versus letting it go on for five years or eight years. And then every season, it just keeps compounding to where I am, where I am now. And I step back and I go, Oh shit, like I've got a situation I got to deal with here. So. Right. I don't know. Yeah. And I think it's really important. You could get really locked in kind of just of the cycle of how things are. And I think you can, either get things on the back burner um, or you're in a space where you're just like kind of in the, the the mood of just cleaning things and just checking on things and seeing things that are for sale. And you're like, Oh, is this thing going to go out this way? Or how am I going to move this animal on to a new home kind of situation? And I think the more that you're kind of in it, even sometimes like you kind of forget you have to sell the geckos. You're like, so in tune of like just feeding and cleaning. You're like, Oh shoot. Like I got to put stuff on the website or mm -hmm. morph market. Are you, however you, um, you know, get those animals to new homes before we go on i want to say thank you to our sponsors 
Impeccable Gecko is a small to mid-sized family operated hobbyist breeder operation. They specialize in leopard geckos with high quality genetics. Their goal is to provide customers with the absolute best animals that they could produce, coupled with honest and transparent business methods. At Impeccable Gecko, integrity and animal welfare are above all else. Impeccable Gecko is a strong supporter of the Strength and Leos podcast, so follow them on social media and check out what they have available. John of Gecko Boa started early, like most of us, catching lizards and snakes in his backyard at any chance he got. Over the years, he has kept and bred more than 80 species of reptiles. In recent years, his focus has turned to specializing within the genus Eublepharus. He has worked hard to pioneer some of the most cutting edge leopard geckos while maintaining genetic purity and honesty. He also keeps the most diverse collection of pure Eublepharus species in the world. He has coordinated with biologists around the world and has contributed DNA sampling and distribution range info to help sort out the cladistic relationships within the genus. Check out geckoboa.com for more info and available geckos. Suburban Geckos is operated by Chris Charlton. Chris's passion and enjoyment for herpetoculture, and more specifically, leopard geckos, drove the desire to take his hobby to the next level. With experience in breeding and raising reptiles well over 20 years, Chris is dedicated to producing quality animals for both the hobbyist and breeder alike. Suburban Geckos treats each animal with the utmost care and respect and cuts no corners when it comes to health and integrity of their geckos. What started off as just a couple aquariums has grown into quite the collection in just a few years, and they wouldn't have it any other way. The dedication to their animals is unparalleled and evident in the quality and health of their animals that they produce. Exemplary customer service is another area where they excel. They're readily available to answer any questions you may have regarding their animals, husbandry, and etc. For more info and to see their availability, check out SuburbanGeckos.com. Lizzy Bold Leos, while new to the scene, is taking strides in following the footsteps of top-tier breeders and keepers in care and ethics while aspiring to bring fresh looks and crosses to explore LinkedIn potential. Prior to becoming a breeder, Greg of Lizzy Bold Leos completed hours of extensive research on lines, ethics, morphs, and how certain traits interact with others in order to begin projects which are coming to fruition already in the second season of breeding. With a major focus on line breeding the correct way and customer service done right, Blizzy Bold Leos aspires to be a breath of fresh air to the customers and keepers they encounter. Be sure to check out their Instagram, Blizzy Bold Leos, and stay up to date on project development, availability, or just tips on having healthy animals in your care. Dab Exotics is a hobbyist breeding operation that was started in 2017. They specialize in producing healthy leopard geckos from top quality genetics. Dab Exotics is an awesome supporter of the Strength and Leos podcast, so follow them on social media and check out what they have available for sale. Shane Kelly is a blue collar, working class guy that has a reptile breeding business with his wife and kids. They are currently working with high quality ball python morphs, western hognose snakes, and select leopard geckos with a focus on bold stripes, and they're looking forward to adding Albi Snow and Ghost this year. They have been listening to the podcast since the beginning and are proud to be a season four sponsor. Go check out their social media, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and also check out their morph market to see what they have available. With all the things that I guess have been going on for the past year or so, does it seem to phase you less the longer you're in it? Or how do you kind of deal with those? Um, I don't know, the, the, the mess ups and the things that happen in the hobby. I don't think it, I don't think it does phase me less. Um, it, it's, it's the same kind of thing as when, you know, people will, will ping me and ask me a question about something where it, it's pretty clear for me that they're, they're new you know, either by the question that they're asking or the way that they ask it. And, um, you know, we'll get into this conversation about like knowledge and experience and things like that. And I, I, it, I would say this is largely the truth for everything, you know, as in my 14th season now, like I'm still, I'm still learning things like every year, uh, you know, something, something new, it's different. Like I'm, I'm certainly learning different things than, you know, somebody in year one, is is learning um but i think you know i say that because there's always there's always going to be setbacks to to some degree um I, I don't care if it's like i mentioned before like just having uh a really not that, you know not that all the geckos aren't important but like you know having that like super important gecko to this project like 
unexpectedly pass or, you know, be infertile or like, um, I, I feel like the last few years, like I've dealt with so many setbacks, um, that it, it really challenged a lot of, you know, what I felt like early on the conversations that you and I would have like that, that kind of motivational, like aspect of, of things where, you know, I would approach it from the perspective of, you know, the only way that I'm stopping this is, you know, if I, you know, got my arms cut off or something like other than that, like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to continue doing this. And I think, um, I think I was challenged with that, you know, more than I ever have been the last couple of years where it feels like, you know, you're just getting bludgeoned and, and beat, like kind of beaten into submission Mm. where, you know, I did have, you know, and they were momentary, but I had multiple kind of conversations with myself going like, is this, is this it? Like, you know, all this stuff that, you know, that I've talked and that I've pushed and been behind over the years for other people. Like, have I, have I hit that point? And, you know, I think part of that is the setbacks in your own operation or your own life. I think part of that is, whatever your perception is of the state of the hobby. Um, it certainly for me has to do with, um, you know, looking at, looking at the hobby, like what it, what my perception of it used to be a decade ago. Uh, and, and all of the friends and, you know, slash, you know, trusted peers that have, have gone, um, you know, and for me, I look around and it's kind of like, what, what happened? Like, where did, you know, where did everybody go? Um, so I think all of that stuff for me, you know, factored into this, this question to myself of like, uh, you know, how much, how much more passion do you have for this thing? Like, you know, can you, you know, between like, you know, the, the, the build was a dumpster fire, which, you know, you have to think like that was to me in my mind, like that was the, the absolute pinnacle of what I had done and all the things I'd sacrificed. Like I I've never been on a, and this isn't a woe is me thing. It's just like informational for people. Like I've never been on a vacation with, with my kids, you know, I've got a, a six year old and a four year old. Um, and last year, like I sent my wife and my kids to Hilton head with her parents and I didn't go like I stayed here and took care of geckos. And when I tell like the average person that I work with that, they're like, what? <laughs> so, you know, there is, and whether or not some of that clearly has to do with scale, like at this scale, like there is, I mean, there's sacrifice for everybody, but like, I can absolutely quantify the, the level of sacrifice that, that I have to make, you know, at this point, um, don't feel good about saying, you know, I've missed, you know, I've missed more games uh, like soccer games for my son this year than I've been to. Like, those are things that I need to figure out, like how to, how to change and, and how to do better. Um, but I, it's, it's all of those things that if you're somebody that's, you know, mindful and, um, you know, introspective and objective and all that, you, you know, you're kind of looking at your whole, scenario here you know geckos included and kind of taking a step back and going you know if we keep this more of a binary decision like you know am i should i still be doing this or or, or should i not like have i have i gotten to that point that i never thought i would get to where it's like it's time to you know shut the doors and, and move on and that's a pretty sobering kind of discussion to have with yourself at least for me at this point um i, I can hardly imagine stopping doing this um so but i think the good news is for me you know is that at this point i, I don't i don't see that happening I, I would like to think that i've gone through the the tough times uh and i think that's part of it is just like sometimes riding this stuff out um you know like a lot of us are doing in the hobby right now you know there's a there's a lull here i'm gonna hear all kinds of people saying that they're selling things and that you know they're selling out of all these eight hundred dollar animals and this and that and the other like got it um whatever uh, you know I, I know from a a general sense in talking to enough people uh 
there's a lull right now, um, specifically a little bit more in leopard geckos, but I think it's pervasive throughout a lot of species. And I think it's just a factor of a lot of it's just the economy, you know, where we're at right now. You know, these are a luxury um, and there's plenty of people that are probably struggling to put food on the table, let alone to buy a $500 gecko, you know, right now. So um, these are the kind of times, at least since I've been in it, like these things happen and this is kind of going to be the make or break. For a lot of people, there's people that were excited to get into it and probably invested some money. And now, you know, they're having trouble selling things or they're having to price break significantly on things. And, you know, who knows, maybe they spent four thousand dollars on a bunch of black knights. That they're not selling <laughs> now. Um, that's these are the kind of times that people are going to you're going to see people get out. Um, and I, I anticipate that there's going to be a bigger turnover this time around than there has been. I mean, I've kind of been relatively unplugged from the 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 social media you know who's doing what i mean and talking to you and some other people it sounds like there's breeders that at least name recognition wise that there's breeders that appear to have gotten out that i wasn't even aware of so you know you you look around and and obviously like i'm super encouraging of you know there should be more and more people that get to the hobby one but i think about like established people uh, established names like if feels to me the perception is like that's that's continuing to drop off um for sure kind of, kind of considerably right yeah. um so i mean I like know. how many people can you name just like off the top who've been in the hobby for more than 10 years at this point like handful if that not many yeah and it's kind of a scary thing where it's like where where's leopard geckos going like do we see it just going to the back burner being a species that was i don't know talking about the glory days of how things were and when morphs and things were being created in a way um with significant you know hype i guess if you want to call it that or with sales being you know super awesome we're going to be talking about the pandemic times as like the height of leopard geckos or when you had you know just your core breeders you know the marshes the rons um you know, those kind of people and you had like a, just a big amount of those people who were kind of holding the hobby and pushing it forward and laid a lot of that groundwork. Is that just going to be a, a pastime kind of situation? Um, and it's a lot of like, what ifs at this point? And as a breeder, um, it's kind of that decision. Like, are you going to ride this wave out? Or are you kind of just going to get out and at this point, and will this be kind of the height of the drop off? Um, and it's, it's really scary and making those decisions and what that looks like for the future. Yeah, I, I wonder what that's all going to look like. And I, I know, again, you know, people can say, oh, yeah, you know, whatever, whatever boomer or, you know, <laughs> I, I feel like a lot of times anymore with leopard geckers, like leopard geckers, I'm like the the old guy, you know, telling people to get off my lawn. Um, and I don't, you know, like to be the the back in my day, you know, thing either. But the reality is, like, I, you know, I did experience you know, those two times, like now and what it was when I got into it. And, and it is like a lot of things, like it is significantly different now than when I got into it. You know, when I, th there were a lot of breeders as far as what they were doing in their establishment in the hobby, like there were all these people that, that I could aspire to back then. Like that was, that was the motivation, you know, for me to to try and get to to that level whether or not back in the day you know that was you know the stuff that matt you know was doing with a m at the time or uh you know gail would all these people um and it's just not i'm not saying that nobody's doing anything nice today and again like it doesn't have anything to do with scale like how much you're producing i just don't see that that passionate visionary i just don't see it and and my concern is is that if you only have a very small subset of the hobby that are trying to keep that mentality and that approach alive like i just don't know how sustainable that is and i don't know the answer to that like you know do we have a bunch of people in the hobby today that a lot of people probably don't even have any context for how things were 10 years ago. So to them, like how it is right now just feels normal. 
Um, I, I still feel like there's a lot of focus on how many likes and how many subs I'm going to get on Instagram. And, you know, I, for me, that, that question always will always beg that, you know, do you, do you want to be a social media influencer more? Or do you want to be, you know, a leopard gecko breeder? You can be both, but like, what's, what's the primary goal here? Um, I think that's great that, you know, you're getting a bunch of likes on Instagram and, you know, you're working with a handful of clowns or something like that. And that's kind of your thing. Like, that's great. But like, it's just not to me, like, that's not going to move the needle for the hobby. It's just, it's not. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't, um, what's the ampaw grandpa, Chris, <laughs> what's that? What? What's the answer? Grandpa, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't, I, I wish I knew, um, I, you know, I feel like that, that this kind of stuff is, you know, it's things that you and I have talked about. I, I, I don't want to say like that I've, you know, preached and used that term because it, it's not like that but like it you know when i get up on my soapbox and give my two cents about you know you know what i would like to see in the hobby like you know the reality is like do i see like nice animals out there yeah you know but if i look at the vast majority of people are selling on morph market right the vast majority of people don't have a website you know so you want to go to morph market and look up leopard geckos and see what comes up on there and the percentage, in my opinion, of low mid to low grade, you know, wholesale quality stuff is, it's huge by comparison to like high end, nice stuff. Um, and that's, that's concerning to me, you know, that, that do, you know, do we have so many people in that are new that don't really get it yet or, or have their footing? Do we have people that are kind of you know, resting on their heels and go, eh, well, you know, I've invested, you know, enough, you know, in, in nice animals. And, and I just, it's that, like, I just don't feel like there's a, that there's a push behind this hobby. And, you know, that's being transparent, like from a business perspective, like, sure, like that's, you know, in some ways, like that's good for, you know, me, you know, if I'm, if I'm putting a bunch of, you know, knockouts out there and, and the competition is more slim because, you know, there aren't that many, like truly like really high end things, but like at the end of the day, like, it's just not good. It's not good for the hobby. I think part of it is, I think part of it is vision. Again, like I, I, I don't, when I have, you know, you and I talked about this a bit before we went live, Evan, you know, when I, I have so many people all the time that are pinging me, pure purple heads, pure this, pure that. Do you have fire bolts with a perfect stripe? Do you have like, it's like, uh, I get it. Like, you know, but like none of that shows me that, and these are, these are breeders that have at least been doing it for a handful of years, right? Like these aren't just newbies, like off the street. Like, so so I go like, again, like, where is your, your vision? And I'll, I had this conversation with somebody the other day it was, you know, where's the firebolts with perfect stripes? Well, I produce a bunch of firebolts every year. And out of those, a handful would be what I would say, perfect stripes. That being said, like, if you came to my operation and looked like I have no less than eight to 10 distinct firebolt projects going in parallel, like I, I am. I believe at this point, like I am hatching like some white and yellow Max Snow firebolts and stuff like that, that are that should be like absolute knockouts this year. Um, you know, I go for like crazy jungly stuff. I have firebolts that literally have produced no black on them whatsoever. Um, you know, it's all like orange and green, and yet like so. I, to me, I'm always looking for that. Um, you know, that kind of oddball that, you know, that catches my eye because that's the thing. Like we're, again, we're only dealing with so many actual genes at this point. This is not by ball pythons. It's never going to be ball pythons. Right. So what is that? If I only have this much stuff to work with and like, so this person is producing, you know, their white and yellow trempers and this person is producing white and yellow trempers and I'm producing mine. Like what sets that apart aside from like the experience 
that people are going to have with say me or like name recognition with the, like what differentiates the animal it's the phenotype it's what does it look like so it's great that it's a white and yellow tremper you know that we're dealing with you know dominance and recessives and but like what does the damn thing look like right like how much intention went into you looking at these two animals from a visual perspective and saying like this is what i want to try and extract out of both of them to create x you know and i just i don't i'm not saying like trying to paint things with too broad a brush and saying that it doesn't happen at all in the hobby i'm just saying largely like i don't i have seen people over the years that that aren't even you know big in the hobby that have produced a nice animal and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give it my like and I'll be like, dude, that's nice. And maybe I send it to one of my buddies and say, hey, look at this. But like, it's that, again, this is all looking at it through my lens. It's subjective, but like what's happening is it's, it's much longer times in between that I'm seeing that, that gecko that I go, wow, that's, that's pretty badass. Um, so like, where is the... I mean, again, not to use like bronze, you know, living art, but to an extent, like it is, there is an art aspect to this, right? Like what, what, what is your eye like when it comes to this stuff? Like, you know, I, I know as I'm sitting here, it wouldn't be flawless, but like, if I looked at somebody's collection, like if I came into a smaller breeder's collection and they said, this is what I have to work with. Like I, as long as it wasn't just like super, like pet smart level stuff like i feel like my like my ability to look at animals and go okay like this needs to go with this and here's why um like i feel like that's pretty tuned in like dialed in at this point um and, and it's it certainly wasn't like that in year one in year two like that that happens over time i think for a lot of people um and it's it's that like i i want to see those people, I don't care if it's their first year, their fifth year in the hobby. Like, I want to see those people creating that stuff. Like that, that's like knocking my socks off. You know what I mean? Like, I want to see people have that vision because to me, like that's, that's true. Like sustain, not only sustainability, but growth of, of the hobby. And I'm just not seeing it right now. And you hear people say, you know, uh, you know, anecdotally, there's nothing happening in leopard geckos or nothing exciting is happening in leopard geckos and all this. And, and my counter to that would be like, okay, well, what are you doing to change that? Were you, you know, three years ago, probably when we were on this podcast and it could have been me, it could have been the round table with me and Don and John, we we're talking about the black Knight phenomenon. Right. And what was going to happen if so many people got hyper-focused on producing black geckos i'm not going to say it's the entire reason but there's absolutely a correlation there to to where we're at right now because they're cool i get it like i'm working with melanistic stuff too but like it is it is a piece of what i'm doing it is not the core competency of what i'm doing like there are people out there that like that's that's their thing and more power to them but i think this gets into this it's it can really kind of be a slippery slope with newer people to the hobby in what they're being attracted to and the information that they're getting on their way in, right? Because if they get laser focused on creating black geckos and we have so many people creating black geckos, like, of course, shit's going to be boring right now. Like, again, like how many people do we have trying to iterate and move the needle? Like, you know, it, it there, there has to be some you know creativity and thinking outside the box to to make that happen and i feel like we're we're feeling that right now um, yeah definitely so and like a nice gecko is a nice gecko at the end of the day like forget names forget morphs like a nice gecko is a nice gecko and one of the things that i'm feeling like i'm seeing more of is it's all about the marketing name what's on we kind of talked about this earlier but just whatever the name of that gecko is you could pick a I don't know, a firebolt. And if there's a line that's like out there that looks 20 times better than a firebolt, people will always pick the firebolt because it's a firebolt, regardless mm -hmm. of how that actual ammo looks, how many years has been put into it kind of thing. And there's a lot of people who are going towards that route where it's like, oh, it's labeled as like a 
ninety percent Black Knight, but it looks like a crappy, you know, kind of dark pet only gecko sort of thing. And people are going that route, and you're seeing that in terms of what people are choosing to pick, in terms of what people are choosing to work with, and you see that totally just degrading what people are producing when it comes to actual nice, high quality looking geckos. I, you know, we we, we have seen. Um, I have people ping me about this stuff all the time. Like they're never going to, most people aren't going to talk about this, you know, publicly, which is why they, you know, ping people like me and they're asking behind the scenes, like, I'll get this, like, Hey, like have you had any issues with, you know, your purple heads producing. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I have. Um, and you know, you, you get, you get enough people saying that and, you kind of go eh, like there might be something there even if it's even if it's a pocketed thing right like so you know you think about all these things that are that are line bred um and we've talked about it before like you, you know maybe something works out you go down that well for like generations and generations and generations and and nothing happens but typically like that's not the case so like hence with firebolts i'm crossing firebolts to everything like the like the stuff that I'm producing right now, like fireballs, the clowns as an example are are awesome. Like the, there's so much potential for that. But like that's what I'm. Of course, like you know, I'm gonna keep like the the gecko genetics stuff and you know, I, purple heads, like all these lines that I have. Like I'll I'll keep the the pure stuff going. You know, as long as it's feasible, but. Like I've done so much crossing when you think like tangerines, like purple head to blood emerine, atomic electric, like all the, and like people are on board at this point, like they're starting to get on board with the atomic electric thing. Like that's a, I think people feel like that's more of a, a thing, like whether it's the name recognition or what, than it is like the purple head to blood emerine or the, or the gecko genetics, the purple head, like to me, two things happening there. One, I'm crossing random lines of, of tangerines to where that weird stuff has the potential to pop out that's going to maybe take that two steps forward and it's and i get ultimately you know this stuff all came from the same gecko and all that but like you know getting away from this like line bred like pure line stuff like it 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 also in theory is strengthening things right so i have had like these gecko genetics, purple head crosses or whatever that, that I, I hatch them out. And I'm like, like, these are knockouts, man. Like they're, they're super nice. And this is just the cornerstone, like the foundation of this cross. Of these So this is F1 and these are looking real nice, but I, you will two camps, like you'll either have the people that you have that conversation with and they understand it and they appreciate it. And they go, ah, like, I get why you're doing what you're doing. And that's awesome. And I'm going to take this gecko. Like, I, I trust your judgment, Chris, that like you're on the right track with this. Or you have the other people that just like pure, 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 pure. Yeah, that cross is really nice. But like, I just, I want the, the, the real thing. Like, and it, it just, it's very, very, very short sighted in, in my yeah. opinion. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that I just, regardless of the outcome, regardless of who buys it, who doesn't like, that's the approach that I'm taking right now, because I'm not going to get to a point to where I, I have this, this myopic view of, you know, of these lines and these pairings to where, you know, I'm going to get to like an end point with all of these individual things. And they're all going to be, you know, short tails or, you know, doing weird things or like, you know, it, the, the, the inbreeding of this stuff, year over year over year like th there's going to be implications to that at some point if there aren't now and and as, as an example not at all throwing shade at, at purple heads i'm just saying like what i have seen some of these smaller newer kind of breeders like pinging me going like yeah have you seen anything and i'm like in pockets yeah like i'm i'm, I'm keeping my eye on it you know um where i haven't seen much of an issue with something like firebolts at this point fast forward this conversation five years I don't know what that looks like, but I'm trying to stay proactive and ahead of all this stuff. Um, so, so a lot of, you know, a, a lot of these more, you know, polygenic line bred projects, like I'm, I'm taking them and kind of crossing them with other 
line bread projects because I'm just, you know, it's probably a little paranoia about, you know, what, you know, what's going to happen in, in years to come. But the, you know, the problem is right now is, as I see it, is there's just a lot of people that don't, that don't understand that and are just so dead set on, you know, getting, you know, you know, X like this, this thing, um, this pure thing, um, not thinking about the fact that, you know, long-term it's probably not sustainable. And I think some of that can go back into, I don't know, what information are they getting coming into the hobby? What circles are they spending time with, you know, in the hobby? Um, what information are they getting from clowns on YouTube? um that really have no idea what they're doing themselves let alone putting information out there for other people and being the entry point that's the scary thing is people like that being the entry point into this hobby um you know when you look at some of the videos out there talking about you know who are the you know who are the best you know the top five breeders in the hobby um and you you know, you throw certain uh, Canadian names, you know, out there uh, that in no way, shape or form should be part of that list. I'm not saying I need to be part of that list. I'm just saying you look at this information, you look at they say top five morphs, you know, these YouTube folks. And they talk about the fact that, you know, Red Diamond was was created by Barry Gardner. Like, I love Barry. Like, all due respect to Barry. Barry produces amazing Red Diamonds. But the reality is, like, that's an untrue statement. Like, you know, we take it back from Barry in the United States, you know, really kind of kick a lot of that off here. You know, that goes back to Luca Gonzini. And before Luca Gonzini, that goes back to Carlo Maya. So, you know, you have, that's just one example of this. If, if that information is wrong, like you haven't, if you haven't done any due diligence around like the origin of these lines and you're ready and willing to make that assumption and spout that out to a hundred thousand people, you know, how much other BS information are you giving to people? And in this day and age, you know, this whole like YouTube, social media, like the, these people are eating this stuff up. Um, and it's, it's scary. Like, the, you know, it's, um, you know, what, what, what are the implications of, of that, of, you know, people being fed a bunch of incorrect information about a lot of things, you know, um, you know, being fed incorrect information about lemon frost or having free lemon frost sent in their box, you know, with other geckos that they purchased or, you know, that this is, it's a legitimate concern for the hobby. Um, I agree. So, um, so I don't know. It's, to me, things are at a state right now, you know, I don't, this is not about, you know, me being, you know, a defeatist or like negative Nancy, but like, this is not, this is so far from ideal where we're at right now as a hobby. Um, and, and I don't know, you know, you, you talk about, you know, what's the, what's the answer? Um, you know, I, I would, in theory, like I would bring a lot of us into the fold of that conversation and, and kind of fire that question back, right? Like what, what is the answer? You know, how, how do we kind of pick this thing back up and, you know, start carrying the torch for the, for the hobby again, because it, it, it feels like it's kind of limping along at this point. Um, and when I, for me, when I, because I because I experienced and saw what it was so long ago, and it was all that stuff that got me into it, um, you know, I would hate to see that. You know, that, heaven forbid, like this hobby end up just being kind of a a whatever, just a, a shadow of of what it was years ago. Um, hopefully, that doesn't happen. But uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that. You know, I haven't or still don't have those thoughts um it, it really kind of um uh, i don't know it, it's difficult to stay motivated a, a lot of times when you think about the broader hobby like there has been that bit of you know i i feel like my thing whether it's whether it's been on here or whether it's like the interactions that i have with people 
you know, on the phone or emailing me or messaging me, like building those relationships and helping people over the last X amount of years. Like it, it, the last couple of years in this hobby has really taken me to a point to where I have unintentionally started to, I've felt myself starting to pull back, you know, because I'm like, I just don't like, I don't necessarily jive with the way things are, are going in the hobby. So it's kind of like, like, I think, I just pulled back and been like, I'm just going to kind of retract back into suburban geckos and kind of go into the shadows and, and do my own thing. Like I've noticed in myself, like a lot of those, a lot of those like more motivational posts that I would do on Facebook and things, you know, you post this really nice animal and they talk about like, you know, the, the background of this, you know, project and really give like a window into like what I'm doing here. I think it's just, natural to when when you feel like to whatever degree that and even if it's just perception that like nobody cares or it falls on deaf ears or whatever it's just kind of one of those things where it's like well you know what like at the end of the day like i know what i'm doing here and you know my animals and my operation speaks for itself so like that's not changing like i'm not going to go anywhere so i'm just going to keep plowing forward doing my thing keeping my mouth shut like you know um and it's easy to, for me, like it, it was easy to fall into that um, kind of trap to the point, honestly, where over the last year, like I know you and I would still talk, but you know, there was part of me that was kind of like, in a way, you know, not dreading having a conversation with you, but dreading coming on here because I was like, I don't really have anything positive to say about anything. Like I'm not super optimistic about things. Like I don't know, um, you know, how I'm feeling about trying to be motivational because in the meantime, like I'm trying to keep myself motivated, like, you know, all these, you know, challenges where I, you know, I definitely feel better today. Um, but to say that I don't have concerns about the state of the hobby would be morbidly untrue. So, yeah. And I think a little piece that I got out of that was just the wisdom of people like, who are you trusting in the hobby? Like where are you getting your information from is a big part of it. I even remember back to like G project atomic stuff from you um, that I was getting like way back in the day. Um, and I was like, I want that stuff with crazy pattern, all this stuff. And I remember like the mail I got from you specifically, like had minimal to no pattern. And you're just like, just trust me, just trust me. And I'm like, Dude, I'm going to get this gecko. Like it's not going to pan out, blah, blah, blah. And I trusted you in the stuff that I'm producing now. Like, totally looking at that like awesome contrast the white and the the orange coming off in the pattern and it's that thing where you're like you're connecting with these breeders who have that history and that wisdom and they they've worked with these lines for years and they know what they're going to get from these animals and people just think that their way is the only way and it's the best way and they don't see any way possible to go away from that and specifically with projects you see people they're like I see this animal, I've heard what it does, I've seen the pictures and I want that and anything other than that is not gonna get me to to where I wanna go in the hobby. And even the animal that they're looking at or the project that they're going for isn't actually what they want. They just want the marketing name behind it. They want the, the hype that's currently in the hobby. And you've seen that, it comes and goes, right? Like what's popular today is not gonna be popular in the next year and so on and so forth. And once you're making these connections with these breeders and really getting into really the wisdom that they have to offer once people are going away from that they're basically saying like i no you actually don't know what you're talking about i'm going to do what i'm going to do but what they're actually doing is starting from square zero and they're making all the mistakes that you made um that you try to like basically protect them from and people don't want to go through that they don't trust and the people that they're going from um which is really disheartening right you see people and as a breeder you know what that looks like people actually connecting to you having conversations if they can't afford a certain animal you know here's you know something that'll produce that in one or two generations and i feel like you just don't see that anymore um in the hobby and it kind of gets away from that that hope that you have and that hope that you could cling on to um and i don't know how to get that into people where they're they're listening and analyzing that information and taking it in really for themselves <laughs> Yeah, I think one one point in particular that you made there that I think is is has merit to like drive home to anybody that's listening to this that might be on the fence or not really understand this is that 
I get it. If I if I have you know a, a customer, another breeder, whatever that's coming to me with a, a a handful of money, and they just want to throw that like at a really nice gecko, like let's say, let's say like it's a it's a white and yellow bell that's like some eight hundred dollar really rare looking knockout, and they are dead set on that. And in theory, that animal would produce probably really nice stuff if paired to the right thing. I get that, but so many people that I have talked to that, excuse me, I may not have that animal at the time, like that animal may have sold, but I'll be like, this one right here is its sibling, potentially maybe even its clutch mate for like half the price or less than half the price. And I'm like, buy this. And they're like, no way. And I'm like, (laughs) okay, like I get it. If if you are dead set, like you've got that eight hundred dollars in your hand, and you want to see that just just killer looking animal, um, I get it. But the reality is this: those two geckos have the exact same genetics driving them. And you know, I I I had it's interesting to watch to watch the experienced the experienced breeders, like the really experienced ones, like people that have you know, come back to the hobby and tried to build out a collection that came to me and, you know, did a lot of conversation about animals that they were going to pick up and specifically picked up animals that were on the lower end side of things, but from the same projects that ultimately got results out of those animals, right? Like you have to understand, I'm not going to say that like the visual piece of the animal, like being that visual knockout, that that got like every perfect bit of of every gene possible and it landed right on that animal like those are great but it's clutch mate from the exact same parents like those genetics are driving that animal it may look not look as nice on the front end but you're also going to pay a hell of a lot more a lot less for it and uh people just don't i I hesitate to think that they think I'm misleading them or that I don't know what I'm talking about. But I'm literally (laughs) like, I, you know, like they both same parents, like the badass parents of this one are the same badass parents of this one. It just happened to, you know, it's just like people like two like really attractive (laughs) people aren't necessarily going to make two really attractive kids. Right. the kids still have the same genetics as the attractive parents. You know what I mean? Like, you know, so it's, again, like some of this is experience, if not being a a little short-sighted. But like I said, like the really experienced breeders that know this and know what they're looking for would just using myself as an example, would come to me and buy, you know, the $250 animals all day long because yeah. the, the genes are they're there you know right. what i mean like it just didn't happen to land visually right on top of that particular animal um so it you know i i think you know i've said this before you know i've had i've had an idea you know when you think about like how can how can one individual like how can you help or or offer help to the whole situation and i have what i i believe is a really solid idea i just have to be at a point where it's it's sustainable for me because it would be a potentially significant time investment for me um and i you know if i were to ever do anything like this like i would be very passionate about the fact that it was a valuable experience for anybody involved um so I've, you know, I've, I've put, you know, little, you know, little breadcrumbs out there, uh, you know, about it, um, because it's something that I've, you know, had in the hopper for at least two years now. Um, I just, when I think about like what, aside from like, you know, us having our conversations and things like that, like what tangibly could I really do to, to like give back to the hobby or to try and you know, all these things that we talk about to try and, and, and move the needle on this. And there's really only one thing that, 
you know, I mean, I, hopefully like conversations like this, even if it just helps like one person or two people, like that's great. Um, and the conversations that I have when, you know, people are, you know, pinging me on social media or whatever, like, you know, I, I have a good feeling that stuff is helpful, but like, if I were going to try and like move the needle and help to not to create like the next, like big breeder again, like I keep going back to the fact that in my opinion, like it has very little to do with scale. Um, but like those breeders that do aspire to whether that's just to take their operation, like what they're producing to the next level, or they aspire to, um, to like do this as a, like as their career at, at some point or whatever that is. Like if somebody really like what's the leopard gecko thing has aspirations, excuse me, to do more than, you know, just producing a few geckos here and doing a show or, um, you know, it's, I want to be able to help everybody, but I feel like the, the way for me to, to really help is to try and connect with those people that do have those aspirations. And I talk to them, you know, here and there, like I'll, you know, people ping me, whether it's Facebook readers or Instagram readers or whatever. And, and, you know, and it's, it's age agnostic too. Like, you know, I have kind of all demographics that, um, that they do it, it sounds like they want to they want to stick with this and they want to take it to the next level again like does that mean that <clears throat> you know you're producing 600 a year uh you know or you're trying to go like full bore and you know get a facility and produce 1200 a year or you know whatever whatever that is but i feel like it's me finding a way to to connect and invest time and knowledge with well, as many people as I can, but really hyper focused on the people that look at at me and say, "Yes, like this is today, right now, like in my life, like this is something that I want to do." Like I'm, I'm willing to invest and kind of, you know, we'll say like put my money where my mouth is. Like I, you know, th this is a thing. Like I want, I want help. Like I want targeted help. Um, so it's it's been on my mind. Um, you know, for, for a couple, a good couple few years now, it's just a matter of, of being able to execute on it because again, like I just, I want it, I, I'm at the end of the day, you know, my relationships and, and the way that I produce, you know, or, or, or approach conversations with, with people, um, you know, in the hobby, it, it's very similar to like what the day job is. And that to me, like, that's, that's just all about leadership and a passion for people and you know having a, a bit of a a gift i guess of, of being able to connect with people that way um but it has to be it has to be a valuable experience for these people um you know the we'll say the um the experience needs to be commensurate with the investment and um I've just been so like life has just been so crazy that I've, I've just never felt like it was the right time to, to do that. Um, because I want to be able to give, I mean, I can never give like a hundred percent of myself to any one thing, but you know, I, I, I want, I would want people to walk away from time spent with me and, you know, after a year and say that was worth every bit of it. And then some, not to ever feel like they were shortchanged or they weren't better or more equipped, you know, at the end of it than before it started. So um, I know this is all to some degree being unintentionally cryptic, but um, yeah, so I just, I, you know, I can't think of, you know, many, many more ways that I can like tangibly you know, give back and, and try and kind of jumpstart the hobby over the next three years, five years, whatever that is. So, yeah, I think it's kind of just with everything else in life, like it's going to be good times, it's going to be bad times. Um, and you kind of have to ride out the waves, but I guess for you, like, what is that? Um, I don't know, like what kind of tangible hope are you holding on to like doesn't seem like you're seems like you're a little shaken but not like getting out of it you're not selling everything crazily you're not 
trying to wholesale and just make your collection disappear. So I guess what's like giving you hope, what's giving you through all this? Um, I mean, I think because we've, you know, we've seen, we've seen dips like this in the past. So as far as like the interest in the hobby itself, you're always going to have that dip in interest and the turnover of breeders. So I, that's expected, like at least every five to seven years like that, in my experience, like that's going to happen. And it feels, I think we're just, there's like a convergence of a lot of things happening at one time, which gives the illusion of that there's like maybe more impact than what there is. So, you know, you've got this turnover uh, of breeders, you know, kind of disappearing and it's a lot of new people. And then, you know, you have the economy and then this perceived lack of interest in leopard geckos in general. So like all of this stuff is like converging at one time. So that's not a good thing, but I think it also contributes to making things feel to somebody like me a little bit more dire than, than maybe what they are. Um, I would like to think that I'm not necessarily the, the optimist all the time. So I have to kind of remind myself not to, to be a diver, um, you know, and, and, you know, try to be optimistic. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, the, the only thing I can say is that I'm, you know, I've gotten through the point to where there was, where I was questioning what I was doing and, and where I was going to go. And, you know, it took, like I said, it, re it really took like starting to see the offspring from this season pop out. And I immediately felt like I was back on track. Like, you know, and ultimately that that's really the only thing that like, you want to talk about true control over anything. I mean, that's really all of us have control over is our own operation, right? I can't right. I can't force people, you know, in the hobby to do, you know, anything else. So it's like, okay, well, I, you know, there's some bit of this where it's like I'm just gonna keep I'm just gonna keep plugging along, you know, and and you know, plowing forward and you know, we'll see what happens next year i mean obviously there's a lot of a question a lot of questions economy wise like you know what is 2024 25 going to look like is it going to be that long before things truly hopefully you know start to to bounce back a bit um but as it relates to where like from a financial perspective as it relates to the uh the hobby right now and and my stuff like i am um uh, i'm not like fire sailing everything you know you'll see you know this new owner of morph market out there you know on the soapbox about you know how low prices need to be and this and that and the other and it's not prices from two years ago and like some bit of that is true but i'll also tell you this like i'm not like i i could not refuse more than to take what what is justifiably let's say uh, a 600 dollar firebolt from two years ago that you know in covid times people were just throwing money at like the, and that's not there was no that's all just based on where the market is and a lot of this stuff you know when it comes to that it's like you know john or me or there's like setting market value for that stuff like sorry like i'm not putting that out into the hobby this year for 250 bucks it's not happening if i'm being completely transparent i'm lucky in the way that i have local people here that do a lot of regional shows uh i have don in texas that a lot of times does the narbc shows and i'll send animals down to there's high-end exotic pet stores you know down there that that don's in connection with so i literally will just based on you know i, I don't want to contribute to the problem because in my opinion we start chucking a lot of high-end stuff out there at low prices. Once the economy corrects, then the market's going to be screwed up too, right? Because now, now we're throwing thousand dollar animals out there for $300, not, not happening. So have I broken on prices a bit? Yes, but I, I won't like, I would, I would rather take that gecko and have that. If I wasn't, if I wasn't going to keep it, if it made no sense for me to keep it, I would rather have that gecko disappear into the pet trade than contribute to something that is going to be a problem even once we assume that the economy corrects. So um, luckily I haven't run into too much of that. You know, it's one of these things where 
um i've just kind of learned like with the space that i have here like you know not not everything is going to sell right now but 99 percent of the time everything is going to sell at some point like you just haven't necessarily got it in front of that person that's looking for that thing or that look or like i've proven that time and time again to, to myself and that even if something sits for a year like somebody's going to buy it 99 percent of the time so i will let it sit you know, for a year plus until somebody comes along. And if they don't and I can't use it, then it will likely end up a pet somewhere, um, you know, or sold with no genetics. Um, it's just principle at that point. Like I will, I will absolutely wholesale it before, you know, I do a, you know, a 75 or 80% price cut on the thing because you're talking about animals that like still to an extent are, are very high end but you know covid times like top of the top of the mark for some of these lines and it's like it's not a it's not a greed thing a money thing because if it were a money thing like i'd sell it for the 250 dollars. you know instead like i'm probably moving it off wholesale for 30 so like i just i we're, we're dealing with one we're dealing with enough problems right now. Like, you know, I'm not that that's the one problem that I'm not trying to to contribute to is, you know, this, you know, where the market is going to be a mess even once the economic situation turns around. And that's I get it. Like I understand, you know, what what people what some smaller breeders are going through right now. It's that space and I don't have the space and you know, now my, you know, animals are ovulating for this season and I got a bunch of stuff sitting in the rack and that's a tough spot. And I think these are the kind of things that people don't necessarily think about when they're getting into this. And, and you really do need to think about like that ability to move your animals, like what's going to happen in that situation when something like this happens and you go, oh, like even, you know, you know, we think proportionately, like even if it's somebody that they're high end animals and what they can get in the market is three hundred dollars, right? Or two hundred and fifty. You know, now are they selling those for fifty dollars? Like it's all relative, you know, regardless of what level you're at. Um, but that's just one of those things that not not here. That <laughs> that is not that is not happening here. No way. Um right. so so, you know, you see, you know, again, people like, you know, Darian or the morph market guy that's, you know, preaching a bunch of this stuff. And that may be, that may be like his perception or, or realistic in some area of, of breeding reptiles. But, you know, if, if 75, 80, 90% of people in, in our hobby need to do that, like, you know, that, that sucks, but you know, you got to do what you got to do. But, you know, right. fortunately for me, I have, you know, avenues to deal with this kind of thing all over the place, um, you know, where it's not going to be, oh, like, now we have, you know, umpteen, you know, top of the mark fireballs that were put out into the hobby for 150 or $200. Like, that's creating a whole different problem.